Okay, th thank you very much. Um, I've, I've got three parts to today, uh, a bit of introduction and backstory, just as Julie said, to tell you uh, wh where I've come from, uh, a bit around uh, real estate and investment management, which is what we do today, and, and then some slides on the entrepreneurial journey and some of the learnings and reflections and, and some of the experiences. I'm sure you'll uh, recognize many of those. So uh, just, just to kick off, um, so the early years, uh, well, it, it occurred to me in my sort of logical, rational mind, you know, you need to start young. Uh, you need to understand finance. Uh, th that is key. And you need to be able to compound and live long. So I think Xavier will talk to you about living long. That's a, that's a pretty key, key part of it. But, but those things at an early age uh, struck with me. And, uh, and, and you start to identify those sort of entrepreneurial traits. I came from a family of real estate people, and you know you start to get exposed to that early on. Uh, gives you an insight into these real assets, which we'll talk a bit more about. I studied engineering, so that was a, a practical side to making things happen and getting things done, and you'll see a bit more about this as we go through. And so I entered the world of sort of public and private infrastructure uh, and real assets, which we'll talk about. And as Julie said, how do we structure finance around those really principally delivering that infrastructure. And then, as we see, we'll match that with the same kind of investors that like those assets and those cash flows. So this will all start to come together over the next few slides. So very briefly, I, I've spent most of my sort of 30 years in, in infrastructure, generally municipal water, where I went around the world with one of the biggest utilities. Uh, uh, energy, uh, EDF, the French generator, Renewables, so I've done some more recent stuff around solar, wind, uh, cogeneration, uh, a bit of engineering, but principally the, the commercial finance and investment side as well. I've done some road, rail, air, housing, hospitals, education, and health, which is generally part of private finance into the public sectors in the UK. So everything's really been around uh, public infrastructure, uh, public services, and actually it's, uh, it's very long-term, pretty unexciting stuff, but, but for me, uh, it, it is pretty interesting and exciting, and, and it's what you can do with that that, that then becomes, uh, uh, hopefully, of, of, of use. I, I guess a pretty key point was I, I, I got a chance to sort of move out of the corporate world. I think Xavier was saying, you identify some early traits, some entrepreneurial characteristics, and you start to feel, am I in the right world? Am I working with the people that I want to be working with? Am I doing what I want to do? And, and I think more and more you think maybe not quite so, but I got this chance to work for Vincent Cengiz, who's a fairly well-known entrepreneur that Julie and I know through. And uh, Vincent was uh, a sort of Iranian Jew, left uh, with the revolution, uh, and we talked about that already, facing a bit of adversity, arrived in London with not much. Reportedly, the, uh, the crown jewels from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the ruling parties, but uh, he, he then embarked on, on some pretty clever stuff, and it was through that that, that I got interested and, and exposed to how to make these things really move and work. Uh, so, yeah, a, lo a lot of structured finance, and again, this is the story just to explain the journey, really, and I'll come to that in a second. A lot of that was around the capital markets. Uh, you know, in the early 2000s, there was plenty of banking, long-term banking money. This was prior to regulatory capital stopping everyone from doing this kind of thing. But we, we were able to raise very large amounts of money uh, on very high amounts of leverage on a very long-term basis. and. Everything I've done has been pretty long-term. In fact, coming down to the 20 and 30 years we are today is really, a, in my world, the short end. So contrary to what we've talked about today in entrepreneurial language, I'm a very long-term investor. We're very long-term holders. We like income. We like inflation. You know, we, we can value that. And that's the concept of cash flow, which, which is you know, pretty traditional, but, but, but still works. And, and I think we'll try and show you how that works. Uh, ratings, uh, you know, these to be uh, rating agencies and, and, and the investment grade and the triple A's and the double A. I don't think triple A exists anymore, but um, we're, we're, we're trying to return it from the ashes. Um, global financial crisis th uh, plus three. So about 2011, after five or six years with Vincent, the, the, the fairly leveraged structure, the, probably the best phrase is when the tide goes out, you learn who's been swimming naked. And, uh, and, th and that was us, you know, it was very, very uh, highly leveraged structures. Uh, th there's a way to use leverage and a way not to. Um, and, and, and I think this is part of the, the experience as well. But, but I think the point there is that you've got to be ready for your opportunity. So although I, I, 
I'd started to transition away from the corporate world and worked in this entrepreneurial environment. Uh, you, you, you just have to wait for your turn, a new opportunity comes, and you're ready for it. So, so that was around 2011, at which point I had a bit of capital, and I was, I, I've got some experience in real estate, so I formed two small you know, private investment vehicles, uh, one for residential long income, and one of the things we did with Vincent was we pioneered the acquisition and financing of ground rents, which are typically 125-year cash flows. And you know, I started buying those myself. Um, a, a quick mention, because this will just 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 tell you the sorts of things we did. We, I think, in 2006, we did a, a, a 500 million securitization on 10 million pound of ground rent income. So we we leveraged 50 times. That tells you how strong those assets and cash flows were. And the point there is that we took these property cash flows and we valued them in the actuarial market. So whereas everyone else was saying this is a property cash flow and you go to your property valuer, we took it to Mercer Oliver Wyman and said, yeah, how does this look from an institutional kind of investment perspective? And they just loved it. You know, they, they loved it. They couldn't believe it, and nor could we. When they gave us the valuation on an actuarial basis at 50 times, we, we just, you know, we went out and bought two and a half billion pounds worth of this stuff. And just, just to give you another little anecdote, um, at that point, we'd swapped out the interest rate for 85 years. So we were doing some really pioneering stuff, and that meant, the poor bank that had lent us the 500 million to buy it and then given us this interest rate swap in 2008 when interest rates were, were slashed. You know, there was 680 million pounds of leverage, 700 million pounds of leverage on a 10 million pound cash flow to an entrepreneur. And, you know, we won't see those days again, but, you know, that just showed you what could be done. And Vincent was extraordinarily good at pioneering. Uh, he looked at the world differently. I mean, he just, you know, at times he, he could seem mad, but he could pull these things off that no one else could. And, and, and we did two and a half billion pounds of these, you know, in, in the sort of public markets, the private markets, and then the banking markets shut. So, you know, there's some interesting stuff there and that, that really changes your view of the world. So anyway, on to that. So after I'd done my own stuff, I, I you know, no one was really interested in this residential stuff. It, it was pretty small. It was pretty uninteresting. It didn't seem that, that institutional. But I just couldn't help thinking this was good quality income. So uh, we, with the banking market shut, we took it to the pension funds and, and insurers. And, you know, like all good businesses operating out of a bedroom, uh, we, we got uh, 60 million pounds, about $80 million of, of, of equity from a local authority pension fund. So on the one hand, I was this entrepreneurial guy with a mobile and a laptop out the bedroom. But then, you know, from a big blue chip pension fund in, in England, you know, we got some money to get started and, and off we went. So. Uh, I mentioned there we, we did that with a sort of a banking partner to, to, to help, but the, the reality was I'd, I'd really got that money before they joined, and uh, that was probably a lesson learned, but um, we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, we're now around 200 million, yeah, 200 million pounds, 2 million plus dollars uh, of, of assets under management, if you like, capital that we, we work with. Um, and, and the final point with all of this, and we'll go on, is, is, is how you join the dots. The dots seem to join, and we're talking about this uh, outside earlier, that... You come to these events, you meet someone, you go there, and at times you're never quite sure what it's for or how it's going to work out. But when you look back, you, seem, you see that the dots have joined. And uh, that will become a theme through, through this. And I better move on because there's a few slides. So, uh, Okay, so I just wanted to show you some real assets because today we're talking about all the digital and new economy and the fintech and the, the, the stuff in the cloud. And, you know, I get all that. Uh, but the, the, the sort of practical side just reminds us that you know people have got to live somewhere and owning a capital asset generates income as Julie said we'll talk about what to do with that uh, you also own an asset that generally tends to inflate uh, over time uh, because that that is what a real asset does you know if you own a, a, a capital uh, asset you will generally see inflation and and what we understood with housing principally housing real estate is that you get a very strong correlation with uh, RPI or CPI or, or, or an, a government indicator on inflation. And we'll talk about it in a second, but inflation is unbelievably expensive. So if we could create inflation on a contract from underlying real estate, we're going to have something quite valuable. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. But this is just a sample of the stuff we own. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about the detail behind that in a second. Just a quick snapshot of some of the partners. It's a highly regulated sector. So, you know, we're regulated by the the... the, the Government regulated for social housing. We're fully FCA regulated as a, as a, as a wholesale investment manager. 
and principally still operating out of the bedroom, uh, but it can be done. So, so and uh, the care care regulator, because some of the properties that we own provide a care service to vulnerable adults, and that's what I want to talk to Julian and uh, Daniel about the whole ESG piece, which I'll t touch on later. But the rest is just to show you, you know, we're pretty set up institutionally and, and full regulation. So, um, y you know, that's that's the, the sort of partners we we've got in place, and these are very long term arrangements. Um, I was talking to Ed and the, uh, our accountant in the room, and I didn't want to disappoint him, so I've just got a few facts and figures. Uh, and so, just just running down, I mean, we established the funds in 2015, and you know, again, I mean, when I look back, it's quite remarkable, really. And uh, I find myself very lucky, but you know, we've got 20 and 30 year commitments to put that 80 million dollars in uh, from a from a from an institutional fund for, for for a very substantial amount of time. So. Uh, We've moved the equity valuation from 80 to 100. That's principally just revaluing the assets. I know we've talked about liquidity, but you don't always need liquidity in the world to do well. And I know entrepreneurs naturally want to sort of build an exit, but uh, th th you can do what Vincent taught us was you could do things with a valuable asset. You didn't need to necessarily sell it. You could hold the asset, uh, you know, and create the, the the value and the and the income from that. We have something called WALT, which is the weighted average unexpired lease term. It's the weighted value of our contracts before they break. So we have 23 years of contractual income, all of it inflation linked, all of it real income. And we'll talk about those numbers in a second. So uh, it, you know, this hopefully will make, make some sense. We've, we've got about 16 portfolios, about 1,100 uh, individual property freehold titles, and, and two and a half, three thousand 3,000 people living in those. So this gives you a sense of the, the, the reality of it. We're generating about nine million dollars. I work in pounds, really, but seven and a half million pounds, nine million dollars of of annual income. And when you multiply that by 23 years, you can see the the value of that 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 asset and that cash flow. And that's what Julie was mentioning. So our what we call our GAV, our gross asset valuation, independent as it stands, about 160 million. Um, the, those funds are both full, fully invested, fully levered, and you know they tick up with inflation on the capital as well as the income. So that ought to, over time, uh, continue to tick up. The income is backed by, by government uh, support and regulation, so we feel pretty comfortable with the credit on that income as well. And if, uh, if, if, if it continues to perform as it has over time, then it will, it will, it will beat our targets. Uh, we're generating about a 6.1 levered yield, which, you know, in a very ultra low world of interest rates as they are, zero or negative is, is, is pretty strong. So, again, we've been able to, to, to construct these uh, from these underlying assets. Uh, we mentioned indexation. We've got annual inflation contracts. So that 6.1 is real. We get that every year in real terms, uh, which, again, is quite attractive, especially when you look at where you know, real rates and risk-free rates are. Uh, we're about 30% levered. Our total expense ratio on the funds is about 43 basis points. I mean, it's, it's a pretty low cost fund, and we'll talk about that in terms of uh, uh, cost to our investors, which which, which goes down well, and, and, th and that's a challenge uh, that, that will come under continued pressure. We, our targeted return was about eight, eight and a half levered. We've hit 12 since inception and, and, and north of 13 in the last year due to some strong uplifts on the capital side. So. We're, we're well ahead, and back to my point about compounding and living long, you know, we're locking in those returns now, and that should keep us ahead of the, of, of the, of the target. So we mentioned they're both fully invested. Uh, we are talking next round fundraising. This is institutional, and uh, we're, we're out doing a bit of that. Uh, we've got a substantial pipeline. I think that comes from being trusted to execute uh, from, from partners who, who, who build them and sell them to us. Uh, we've fully embraced the 21st century with new telephones, laptops, email, Excel, online banking, and a no-tie policy, uh, even a no-jacket policy in uh, in, in, in SIA. Uh, and you know, sometimes we have to do different thing, things differently. Rather than just keep growing the AUM, we figured if we uh, reduce the size of the office or keep it small, then then we can uh, we can be sort of a world-beating AUM per square foot. So. Uh, in good order, we've managed to keep that pretty tight. Uh, quick look, there's, a, there's a, a few of us, not many. The point there is you can run 200 million plus of capital with a very small team. And uh, that, that's pretty stable. We've all been together for a while and, and it works well. And we're a, you know, we're a deal machine. We do about 15 deals a year, both equity acquisitions and refinancings. And, and, and you, you know, we'll talk about the, 
the, the ability just to keep doing those deals against challenges and, and, and markets and all sorts of stuff. Just a bit about real estate and investment management. Uh, it, you know, the key here is we keep it really simple. Execution is hard enough, so, so we just try to keep everything really simple. I mean, there are two huge challenges uh, out, out there in the big wide world. One is that we're sitting on now 70 trillion of negative interest rate debt. It's just extraordinary. And I think we'll look back on that in three, five, ten years' time and say, how, how on earth did we let that amount of debt build? And I think governments have no option. They just keep pulling the lower interest rate lever and there's nowhere else to go. We're now looking at, well, we are already in negative interest rate territory and that may become the wholesale rate now and the retail rate negative. As, as, as I think Max said, you know, with Deposit Solutions, he's providing a positive return on cash deposits. So that's an extraordinary situation we're in. Um, inflation too, there's ex very, very expensive to buy an inflation link. And if you're an institution, you probably have an inflation liability somewhere. And if you buy a 30-year government inflation link guilt, you're probably going to be paying one and a half to two negative real spread to lock in 30 years of inflation. So that, that I th and a number of us have mentioned that today, you know, inflation is a, is a real challenge. You can only keep dropping interest rates and, and, and printing money uh, before you, you, know, you create an inflation problem. And, and that's, I'm not sure that, that inflation is, 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 is really acknowledged as the big problem, but it, but it is. And uh, it, it might sound like a, 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 a single word that doesn't mean very much, but it's, it's compounding up and it's very, very real. And, and it's something we, we, you know, we, need, we do need to solve. And we're in our very small way, we're trying to solve it by writing inflation-linked contracts. Um, but, but that's a real challenge. You know, equities uh, generally are, are returning seven annualized, maybe slightly better total against, you know, we, we're seeing the, the six, we did a deal two weeks ago on a, a, a small, you know, 20 million drawdown of debt, 16 years institutional, and the 16 year interest rate swap was, was 23 basis points. So even 16 years out, it's looking like zero for 16, nearly zero for 16 years. So it's an extraordinary time. Uh, so what we do is we use property to construct these cash flows. We write these specific property contracts. Uh, ALM is asset and liability matching. So we may be uh, delivering a return for, for, for 25, 30 years, but that is a, a perfect match to what our investors need to pay out to their pensioners, their annuity funds uh, over the next uh, number of years. So it, it, you've got to get that structure right on day one. And, and we're able to do that using these structures. So, and, and the bit that we link back to is that we're able to create these cash flows in the real estate markets so using physical bricks and mortar with a lease contract, but we can value them in the actuarial market or the investment market. And certainly there's, there's a pensions regulation, something we're not directly exposed to, but our investors get a credit for liability matching. In other words, if they're matching their risk, they get an enhanced uh, regulatory uh, benefit. So, uh, is maybe a little complicated words, but the, the, the concept is quite simple. We're just taking risk out and we're creating very strong real returns that match out for a very long time. And this is a scale business, you know. Uh, we, we don't try to take much out of it. We just try and build scale and, and solve a, 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 a real large problem. And, uh, and that's what we continue to try and do. I think the key here is we're able to work between the property market and the, and the actuarial or the investment institutional market. That works well. Uh, these assets aren't so well valued in the real estate as they are in the in the investment market. Structures, uh, again, we're matching. Uh, we use leverage, but we're able to because we've got very strong security. We can pledge the the asset. We can pledge the cash flows. You know, if you're generating six and your cost of debt is two or three, you know, it's a very bankable deal for an institutional. And 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 our, and our investors, principally Rothschild, uh, value it investment grade. You know, which is quite unusual. And I talk about getting that quality really high. And I think that's one thing that Vincent taught us, you know, it was the quality of that income, not, not just the quantity. We're not looking for outright return, we're just looking for a very long-term secure stream. Execution is everything. I mean, these, these structures are relatively simple, but we, we, we just go out and find them and buy them, and so we're doing deals almost on a monthly basis, and that's just a constant uh, form of, of, of executing those, those transactions, and we've got, we've got a good setup to do that. Uh, we, our output is institutional, but we always act independently, and we and, and our 
approach is entrepreneurial. So, y you know, we we work fast, we work without bureaucracy, and uh, but we deliver to the institutional market where we spend time getting it right on day one. The, the, the downside of creating these long structures, if you get it wrong, you've got to live with it for 20 or 30 years, so it really sharpens your thinking. Reputation track record, we work hard on that. That, that over time continues to build and, and, and helps. That hopefully should help us going forward. And uh, we, we, we think now the funds are full and that's proved the concept and, and given us a platform for growth. So our, our next stage is really to try and raise some bigger money, deploy that in much the same way and, and, and do what we do best. Uh, just a bit about the future of real estate and asset management, just down the left. Uh, I think Tal, if he's here, we were talking last night, We th uh, Tal thought there were maybe four or five hundred trillion of real estate. I, I did a quick run, it's seven trillion in the UK, it's probably a bit more now, of total real estate. Um, so it's uh, 100, 200 trillion, it's a huge sector. But it's very traditional, it's very conservative, it's labour intensive, inflexible, slow, and demand continues to outstrip supply. So. Those are the challenges we face. There's very low innovation, and we've heard a lot about innovation today, but there's very low innovation in real estate sector, so that's, that's an opportunity as well. We're starting to see a little bit of that, but it could be more. COVID has accelerated the, uh, the change. I mean, I was thinking that, you know, the convergence between work and living is, is happening fast, and, you know, we're here at a, a, uh, an international event and we've managed to do it in Julie's front room. So I, th I think that's that's convergence in action. And, and, you know, we're all quite happy about that. I mean, it's a very nice way to work and uh, it's actually conducive to, to good thinking, working, talking and, uh, and, and collaboration. So, yeah, it's just a real example. But but if you think about it, you know, you've got some sets of residential has been very resilient. You know, people need somewhere to live. And when everything else comes under pressure, that non-discretionary uh, rental mortgage becomes the thing you have to do. So you can avoid staying in a hotel, you can probably avoid going to the gym or the restaurant for a little while, but you can't avoid going home to sleep somewhere. So that roof over your head has become more important than ever. And I think we're, we're fortunate with that, um, and that will become very very, po very polarised. And, we, and we start, we'll talk a bit more about the performance of those assets as well, which are going to drive valuations. I put this in, democracy isn't working, because, y y you know, we... <laughs> We're trying to deliver housing, and we just find it enormously frustrating. And I did a talk on the future of infrastructure and what you get. I mean, it took 12 years to, to make the decision on the second runway in the UK, which was finally Heathrow. 12 years to make a decision through the courts and the government and the whatever. And in five years, the Chinese built 66 international airports. I, I as mean built, built from scratch, operational. Now... To just keep our sustainable friends happy, I'm not saying that's the right way, but we're at one end of the scale where very little happens, and we need it. And at the other end, you know, stuff is getting done, and and that's a real source of frustration and cost, and 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 it's a huge barrier. So we 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 need to do a lot more with that. Just quickly, I mean, as we said, you know, we, we're trying to get more information, data, and technology into the sector. I mean, for example, we've got a little lending business, and now you know we've got an online valuation app. So you can see instantly from a lot of data what that property is worth. You can take it off. You can you can you can call it from general housing databases, and you can put all the local factors in and the comparables, and come out with something that's pretty accurate. Um, valuation remains. I mean, it's a pretty liquid, large market. So for us, that's quite straightforward. Transactions are still hard work and slow. We need to make that more efficient and, and systemized. The utilization of an asset, and we, uh, you know. By day, this is a international conference room. By night, it's where the work the working team sleeps. So you know that utilization is going to double up. It won't be a a home that will be empty most of the day. It will be you know we're going to see that more and more. And I think working from home is is where y y you know people will double up. They'll want a better place to 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 live because they're going to work there. And 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 so I think we're going to see a lot of that. Management and performance of real estate. Uh, I'm, I'm an exec of a small energy business as part of my, my early work, and y you know a lot of a lot of work around the performance of buildings is going to affect those those valuations um, over time. And you know, back to this point here, we need to find ways to to deliver real estate faster, better, and cheaper. Just quickly down asset management. I'm conscious of time. Um, markets and regulations have changed. You know, uh, r regulation isn't really solving a problem. It's, it's 
it's it's slowing us down it's creating bureaucracy and it's not really making a big difference on some of the things that happen that still happen so th there's work to do on that there remains a huge weight of capital out there and and that's what's causing really the the uh, the interest rate to, to drop very uh, significantly and um, you know we need to find a home for that that can generate real returns there's a big rise in the mega funds I think we touched on that there's uh, there's some very low cost large ex exchange traded funds and uh, they're, they're very successful I think where where we see the alternative is the specialist funds alternative assets doing the sorts of things we've outlined where we're very in the detail we've got a very specific focus and we can deliver those uh, excess returns that, that work really well for institutions so you know we're going the other way on that and I think that will be alternatives are a very fast growing area as as hopefully a lot of you guys know through VC funds and new technologies and new ways of, of building out those businesses uh, this uh, we talked about it really the, the challenge of finding attractive risk weighted returns and the inflation problem liquidity um, not everyone needs liquidity. Some of the big institutions need a 30-year cash flow, and they don't want to sell it. Once they've got it, they're happy, and, and you know that. So liquidity works in some ways, but it isn't always needed. And you, you don't want to be paying for liquidity you don't need. So if you want to go to the public markets, fine. You can pay a price for that. We've seen our competitors in the public markets. We've seen their valuations go all over the place. You know they're down 20%, up 10 in a year. So they've moved 30%. Ours just works away in the private market. There's no liquidity or, or, or trade effect uh, fees are under pressure we run a very low management fee I think uh, over time there'll be more scrutiny on transparent fees you know less on performance uh, and you've just got to deliver for your shareholders and, and you get paid to do that but you know they'll expect to take most of the excess return and there'll be more pressure on that so again you know there'll be expectation of better information use of data and, and technology to report. There's some, some good software out there. We're, we're still pretty basic. We're very small though. There'll be a focus on the balance sheet. You know, there's this concept of AAA seems to be a, an old sort of a term now, but, but it still matters. Uh, and particularly at times like this where th there are real challenges in the market and you need a balance sheet to weather the storm. And that storm's quite, quite uh, long term at the moment. And so that, that, that still matters. Again, performance and reporting to investors. Uh, and I think it's the, not just the, the, the kind of technical performance and, the, and, and, and it, it's just the honesty, transparency and giving your investors warts and all what they'd like to know. They, and, and that can be a positive. You, can, you know, we all face challenges. So it's no problem to tell them it's been a tough year or we got that wrong. And I think they like that. So that, 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 that'll be key. Uh, ESG is, is a really big thing. And uh, a number of people here have been uh, are focused on that. That's environmental social governance where you're expected to deliver a positive social impact on what you do. So just returns are no longer enough. Uh, that primarily is what they need as a start point, but then ESG now is a huge opportunity and, and that's our next challenge really. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to people who can help a bit with that. And keeping the structure simple and the fees quite low and efficient. Uh, and certainly in our case, we're trying to build some scale. Time. Okay, so a couple of slides just on the entrepreneurial reflections and learnings. Uh, it is tough. Um, I know everyone here is going through it, has been through it, is about to start on it. So just just a few thoughts, really. I mean, we, we don't think it's, it's it's a game where you need 160 IQ. Luckily for me, uh, we, we you know we we're we're pretty old style. We we, we maybe not even old, maybe an old Old Testament uh, approach. So. Unless you've got the brain power of Tal and you can work on digital securities, uh, you know, we're just working an old style way of executing long term cash flows. You've got to find what you love doing. I mean, it's hard. You've got to get up every day and keep going. So, you know, it helps a lot if you really like it. And if, if you're not sure, you've probably not found the right thing. So, you, you know, keep going until you find what you really love. And, and, and this, that's vital. Uh, think a bit about your plan, but don't overthink because you'll think yourself out of it. You know, you really will. And you'll meet a whole number of challenges that, that you wouldn't have thought of. But if you thought of them, you'd never have started. So, so you know, don't overthink it. You know, pick a direction and, and really execute, I would say. You get paid for what you do. You know, there's all the thinking and business planning in the world. But if you keep it simple, work out the big issues and then find a way long term to your goal, you'll, you, you'll do fine. And 
again, start early, compound and live long. That really does work. Uh, and, y y you know, I know there's an entrepreneurial cycle, particularly with VCs. Uh, and in that respect, if you're exiting, you've got to find a better opportunity, really, for your exit to go back in, unless you're going to call it a day and, and do something else, which is a different matter, really. Uh, yeah, keep, keep your eyes on your goals. Otherwise, you'll, 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 you'll go off piece too easily and quickly. And, and you know, it's, uh, it, it, that y you don't want a flat tire to, to cause you to, you know, scrap the car is the analogy, really. Uh, hard work really counts, and it creates opportunity and luck. And you just got to work 18-hour days, meet as many people as you can, and look, listen, learn as, as, as much as possible. Progress isn't linear. There's a really nice concept that I came across. Funny, when you've been through it, you recognize these things. But, I, you know, you're going to need at least a year, at least, and probably two. And there's something called the Valley of Disappointment, which is where you have this idea of everything going really well and upwards and onwards. But, but after a few months, you know, you find yourself really down the deep, dark valley and it's hard work and, you know, it's not going to plan. And that's the Valley of Disappointment. And if you can work your way through it, you'll probably get yourself back on track. But it's definitely not linear. You just, you just got to find ways every day to keep going. Definitely go to bed every day a bit wiser. You know, if you've, if you've sat in a meeting and someone's asked you a really difficult question, don't just sort of leave it and think that, that, you know, go home, find out what they meant, solve it in your head and, 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 and you know, get up the next day with a bit more, bit, bit more wisdom to, to, to answer it next time. You've got to love the challenge, the people, the work. Uh, you've got to take a bit of risk, but, but don't let that put you off. Uh, over time, your resilience builds and your confidence builds, and then you feel like you can, you can make anything work or happen, and it, it makes a big difference. Turn off the news and the noise. It'll drive you mad, you know. You know, all this constant, whether it's Brexit or COVID, I mean, I'm finding it pretty boring, I admit. You know, it's, I think that you better, there's nothing you can do about it. You, you've got to take responsibility. All smart people, take responsibility for looking after yourself and others. But, but don't spend your day listening to the news over and over and over. You know, that's what the media are trying to do. Switch it off and, and, and go and do something that's more valuable to you that can make a difference to what you're trying to do. And, and I, I, you know... You've got to think independently as well. You've got to hunt out the facts, and you won't find that by being fed a constant stream of mainstream media. You know, get into the data, get into the facts, and, and understand them and make your decision, and, and you'll be right. And that's a lonely place, but, but it will work. We talked about reputation and track record. I think as FT have taught us, you know, work hard, play hard. You know, you can be out on the boat. It's all part of the, the experience. And then, you, you know, you get up the next day, and, and, and can get into a whole day of, of, of working really well. So I think it's, it's, you know, you feel pretty engaged and alive at these things, and you, you, you can do those long days without too much trouble. Be good at the detail, but there'll be about 20 major decisions in your life. Those are the ones you've got to get right. Everything else probably won't really matter. Five years on, you know, you won't really look back on a small thing that caused you a few sleepless nights. It's the big things that, that, that are going to make a difference. I think it's a sort of a final slide, so th thanks for bearing with us. Uh, I got a bit carried away with this. Maybe it explains the journey's been fun, tough, exciting. Uh, I, I, everyone's got the ability. There's no question about that. We're, we're, we're all born into this world of opportunity, and uh, there's no end of it, really. It's just how you apply it. Uh, so, you know, those characteristics of hard work, discipline, integrity, resilience, teamwork, they're going to count. And, you know, that's what you've got to work out uh, uh, how to apply best, I would say. Choose your partner well, really well. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a challenge, and you know you need to go into it knowing really well what, what you're signing up to, and uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult getting out of that. I've been there, and it caused us to do nothing for two years, and it got very, very difficult. And you know, we were just bullied by a big guy, and we just never gave up. You know, We never, never, ne I'll come on to that point. That's probably my best skill, really, just never give up, ever. Uh, this is interesting. I don't outsource everything. I was talking to, I think, Jonathan, actually, at lunchtime. You know, it's easy to outsource. You know, I need a sales team. I need a sales guy. I, I need an HR person. But actually, you know, you do it yourself. You, you get it right. It's the way you want it. You understand it. You learn. You, 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 kind, of, you kind of keep control of what you're trying to build. And, and I would say that's, that's something to think about. You can't do everything. But it's important to make sure you don't automatically outsource. There's definitely a price you have to pay, so make sure you understand that price. Are you willing to pay it? It's a few years of hard work, but like most things, it pays off, and uh, you just got to be prepared to keep going all the way. Um, you get to 
do what you really love with people. I mean, it doesn't get better than this, right? This is a room full of go-getting, make-it-happen types of people, and, and that's just a great place to spend four or five days. So uh, that, that's a big plus. Uh, take personal responsibility and, and, uh, and deal with it. Uh, definitely, you're going to have to. There's this, you know, you're going to feel uncomfortable, anxious, nervous, but you get through that, and eventually you don't really experience that so much. Uh, we, do a, we do deals all the time, and, and on every single deal, we meet 20 deal-breaking issues. I just can start the clock, and I can say, right, there's the first one, we've dealt with it, and there'll be 20 things that will all have the ability to stop you doing that deal or overcoming that goal, and you know, you've, you've, you've just got to never give up. The, you know, the will is really important. All the skill won't do it, but the will will. So that's, that's, that's my other thing. This delayed gratification, sometimes you've, you've, you've just got to be patient that your time will come and not be constantly looking for the win today, the win today, you know, and, and that's a challenge. You know, that's, a, that's a challenge. So uh, that, that's something to buy time. You know, time's on, it, it doesn't feel like it, and you may not have a lot of money and the ability to keep going, but time's on your side, and you need to, you need to use it as well as you can. It won't, won't go to plan, but it will work out. Wh when I say stay above the line, I mean stay above the sort of water line. Once you're below the water line or you're behind your plan or you're running behind your budget or your financial resources, it's very hard to get it back. You know, you're going to either have to borrow your way out or buy your way out with equity or debt or something. And, and so I'd say, you know, try and keep your head above the water all the time, almost every day. Once you go below the water, it's very hard. You're on borrowed time. Uh, be prepared to change. Y you know, you can have a goal and a plan and be very fixated, but sometimes you've got to change, and uh, that's important as well. Um, as I say, the best thing I probably have is, is just never give up. And uh, if you never give up, you can't lose. So, so you just run out of time eventually. But, y you know, you, uh, are above all these things, these things matter. I would say learn from our hardworking, kind, y you know, FTE team, Julie and the organ. I mean, they're, they're here everywhere in the back, you know, behind the scenes, sorting everything, making it all happen. And, you know, that's the sort of trait you want in your, in your, in your efforts. Uh, and our Greek hosts are just incredibly friendly and, and want you to have a good time and, and nothing's too much trouble. There's no real safety briefing. They don't worry about all that sort of nonsense. And when you're an entrepreneur, that's a real breath of fresh air. You know, you don't want to get on a boat and spend four hours learning uh, how to survive if it's going to see you want to get you, you, you know you want to get on the boat and have a good time and uh, life's short so you know I'm a, I'm a, that's a big issue that's a that's a big issue and 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 probably the last thing is wherever you are on your journey keep keep faith it's worth it one day you'll look up and back and uh, the, the dots will have joined up for sure if you work hard and keep going you won't see it at the time but the dots will all join up and then they'll all start to make sense and uh, you'll be one of the fine uh, people of your generation thank you very much Thank you so much for sharing that. That's just tremendous. And there were so many sure. so many things that I, I, I wanted to ask at when you're I mean, just incredible. Before I start dominating the Q and A, do we have any questions here from the audience for Harvey? I've got yeah, two for myself. Here does the um very inspiring. Thank you very much, actually. Um I had a question uh, about whether or not you think crowdfunding, uh, as far as real estate assets goes, I mean, real estate is a very old time, important, has been industry, but as far as crowd crowdfunding goes, when it comes to like down to small people that don't necessarily like have all these big funds starting off their career or whatever, do you think uh, there's a future in that? for that matter? For sure. We, uh, I mean, crowdfunding has filled the gap that banks have dropped in a big way. I mean, and, y you know, you've picked up on an important point. You know, there's nothing on cash, so there's an attraction for, for starting to lend directly. Uh, crowdfunding has taken huge amounts of money. Uh, it's been very successful. I think there's a bit of a shakeout between the sort of winners and losers uh, and the wheat from the chaff, but uh, it's being widely used. I think that, the ch and certainly in real estate, with with the kind of security you can you can get, that's quite attractive. Uh, that the problem, and I've been quite involved in this with 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 quite a serious peer to peer and working with them, is that 
you are the direct lender. Uh, you are not lending to a vehicle that on lends. The, the vehicle normally is just marketing and arranging that transaction. So you have very little protection. There's a whole issue around regulation as well. Um, there are people who understand what they're lending against, but there are a lot of people who aren't, you know, and at the moment it's in that early stage, fast growth, exciting time. But there's a worry that there's, there's certainly, and we've looked at this very closely, the danger you get is that some of these borrowers aren't great. They can't repay. So what happens is the peer-to-peer -peer will extend the loan and they'll roll up the interest that they're in arrears on and the debt's growing and being pushed back, which is what I would call in default. But what the peer-to-peer -peer lender would say, we've refinanced. And there's a whole issue that's really under regulatory scrutiny. There's a, there's a whole issue of understanding that. So I'm saying it's a great thing and it, it's potentially really uh, strong and it's grown very rapidly. But like, there's some definitely some underlying issues that, that, that are gonna that are going to surface, and uh, you know, we we worked with one that was listing, and they were just burying the problem because they couldn't afford this to to surface. You know, when the tide goes out, back to the same problem. Really, they 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 were just refinancing all these loans so they could list their business without showing the default rate. So, and that's the, the not so good side of capitalism. But uh, it's 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 a good uh, fill for the for the banks. It's low cost, it's quick, and it's attractive. But but there's some uh, some issues to to work through. Jonathan, you had a question. Thank you, Harvey, very much for also taking us through that your personal perspectives on it. Um, you mentioned um, you mentioned your long term approach. You also mentioned joining the dots at the start, and you have a previous background in renewables. Now, given that you have lots of property, lots of roofs, and probably quite a bit of land, do you ever see a market or a new revenue stream that? links into renewable energy or, or, or others, a long-term future? Well, I mean, you've, you've really, yeah, pulled the number. That's what we were saying about working across the different horizontals. Yeah, I mean, you've picked up on something really interesting, and certainly Julie and I have talked about something called infratech, mm. which is how can we take technologies and create this kind of asset and cash flow off of it? And one of those is to bring in some renewables, whether it's solar PV. I mean, we've got, you know, 1,100 uh, roof spaces that we own that we could put solar on or we could put renewables in or a whole range of things really so yeah the answer is very much so and and we're, and we're really keen on that um and and we are thinking and looking at it uh, and we like that kind of thing so yeah, i think you've hit something really interesting there we've we've almost got our own market so we're starting to look at some of those things uh i've done some solar pv on large portfolio rooftops uh I just need to refresh on some of the, the rates and returns. Uh, the, the, the returns have dropped, but the capital cost has dropped. So I just need to refresh on those. But I think that's right up our street, and that's a, that's a na natural next step. So yeah, we ho we hope to be doing that. So uh, I'll, I'll be giving you a shout for that. That's great. It'll really help us marketing it. Other other questions? Yes, please, Javier. Thank you for that, Harvey. Um, how do you view um, the opportunity in other European markets versus the UK? Is it just a copy and repeat in other markets, or is the regulation completely different? Uh, an, a, another good uh, question. Um, potentially, uh, we like the opportunity. I think two things, really. We don't really understand it well enough. And, and, and uh, what I hope to get across was that whilst we're working in a pretty simple investment world, we're really in the detail. So. Whilst it might look like we're just buying these lease contracts, we, we understand exactly how the cash flows work under the income, the amortization, the inflation, the correlation with RPI, CPI, the, the long-term housing market, capital pricing, all this stuff we understand. And we don't know that yet in Europe. And I think that's our USP. And until we know it, we don't feel that confident. But we, we have started a little lending business and we do work with a with a partner who's very keen to go into Europe. He's a German guy. He understands Europe. Uh, so that may be the way to do it, actually. Uh, it's not regulated, and there isn't really a market. And we think, we, and it's kind of back to what Marcel said about it's not quite peer-to-peer -peer lending, but we're a non-bank lender. And, and in that respect, we are keen to do it. We've looked at some of the Dutch markets for very large social housing. Um, in, in, in Holland, they don't have the regulatory support that we do here. So that's a slightly different credit position, and we'd need to understand it better. Uh, but, but again, it's a market we could go into. Again, we've talked about 
you know, opportunities here. I think I think there are they're definitely there. We just need to to devote a bit more time to it and, and really understand it. Now we've finished the funds, I think we can do that. So that's a that's, that's a pre-Christmas homework. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, please. Hi, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I really like that you broke it down into three sections and also the last one about reflections and learnings, which very much reminds me of the conversation we had uh, the first night. And so um, if you had the chance, is there anything that you would have changed um, in the past? Uh, not majorly. And I'm quite a big believer in this things happen for a reason the dots join and I think that was quite key and I started with that and I finished with that and I think when you look back it all kind of makes sense I, I've had a fairly unconventional career I, I sort of went left and right rather than than up but you do do build a really broad experience of of all those issues and I think eventually in the time frames those all feed into giving a really complete and comprehensive understanding so Probably it took me, I wouldn't say longer, I, in some ways I've, I've never been the fastest, but I'm sort of there, in, I mean, I'm a, long, I'm a long-term guy, so, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get there that quickly, but when I start young and compound and hang around, live long, you kind of hope that you'll do something useful in the end, so, not really, no, I mean, I, mean, I feel lucky that, you know, I'm, I love what I do, and, uh, and, and broadly, I mean, probably the, the tough one is the partner issue, we, we did start out with a big... Uh, actually, a, a small financial services group that was then bought by a big one, and um, that that was just totally incompatible, you know, with a big bureaucratic financial services organisation and, and, and little us out of a bedroom, really. And yeah, it was bizarre because this was a listed Australian financial services group, and I remember it. You know, we were still in the early stages, and there was a press release went out to the Australian Stock Exchange, which is 12 hours ahead of us. A friend of mine working in Sydney for, for one of the big financials, he sent me a, a text. He said, oh, you, is this you? This is you on this stock exchange announcement. I said, no, it's not us, not us. And he, he sent it to me at 7 a.m. on the train into London. And without asking us, they'd put us first opening paragraph on the announcement. We were, we were nothing. And they used this to create some sort of news without our permission. I was gobsmacked. And it was us. And, and so we were just totally incompatible, you know. Uh, so I think that's... It's the human side where judging people and understanding people and, you know, putting spreadsheets together is the easy bit. But that execution relies on people. And, and I think that's the, that's, that's the biggest, steepest learning. Thank you. Any other, any other uh, questions? You know, you mentioned at one point you had that democracy doesn't work. And I think, um, you know, in Switzerland, what's fascinating about the... Um, uh, direct democracy is they have referendums constantly. And so, you know, building things and getting things done, uh, whether it's, you know, raising taxes, building this or, or whatever, it's it's a different model. And I think uh, to some extent, I, I'm wondering, well, why can't that happen elsewhere? Why can't we trust people to make decisions? You know, it requires an educated group of population, but, you know, if we educate our people, then um, driving a more direct democracy down to the lower, you know, it's almost a joke in Switzerland how many uh, referendums happen and so forth. So, um, other questions for Harvey? You know, um, when you you spent some time with Tal and um, you know the whole tokenization side of, of property, um, you you work with institutional investors and so forth. Um, you mentioned alternatives as a as a huge uh, area for growth and so forth. H how? Well, do you think the institutional market is ready for things like the tokenization of property? Do you think, do you think that uh, there's going to be real appetite for that in the foreseeable future? Oh, for sure. And I mean, what I've set out here is maybe just a little different, old-style cash flow investing. But mm -hmm. you know, I can also see the future mm -hmm. clearly. We tended to focus on what we do, but there are and our investors are pretty traditional, you know, yeah. local yep. authority pension funds, etc. But you know, there's a, a, there is a huge amount of capital out there that, you know, will allocate to different asset classes and technologies, and uh, that for sure there are there are many out there. I would say our very traditional institutional market probably not. Uh, where they might do is that next step, which is the sort of rooftop renewables on the estate, um, but. I don't think they're quite ready for where Tal is, but there are plenty of investors that are. 
right. like but for sure and uh, you know that that that's probably early earlier stage than us we're more mature sort of uh, yeah. investors at this stage just because the nature of our of our guys but um you know i'm i'm interested in it you know i can see how you need to improve the way you transact and and value these things and 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 you know i talked about the slow inflexible low innovation real estate market and that's a problem so we do need to start looking at these things and but someone else is probably going to take that earlier risk than us because it's just earlier stage risk but mm -hmm. it's high risk high reward so it's you know it will happen for, for sure and there's plenty of people around for that excellent Listen, I really enjoyed listening to you talk about your entrepreneurial journey. I've been wanting to hear that for a long time, and, and I thought it was absolutely outstanding and exceptional. Would you please join me in thanking Harvey for his uh, presentation?